Good morning, DCN. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If nothing else, you will take this home with you and engrave it in your hearts. For God is a good God. He's creator God. He can make something out of nothing. He is creator God who speaks, and it is. He is God that gives us hope. He is a God who is with us today. He is not just the God of the people in the Bible. He's the God of us who in today he works just like he did at the beginning and even before creation. His power is still potent today and his word is still valid because he is truth defined. And when he speaks, we listen and we obey and we see his glorious works. Amen? Uh, I'd like us to turn to Genesis chapter 39 this morning. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And please, uh, I'd like us all to turn there, whether in your uh, Bibles or in the Bibles that are provided for you or in your Bible apps. I'd like us all to turn there because we'll be studying through this chapter. Genesis 39. And I will read for you the whole chapter. Many of us um, are lean on our Bible reading. Uh, including myself, and I want to get better at it. And today I want us to read the whole chapter together uh, and learn from the life of Joseph. How many of you have heard Joseph before? Joseph? Joseph from the Bible. Okay, great, great. How many of you know his name, Uh, what his name means? Anyone knows about the the meaning, the definition of his name? Uh, Joseph Yahweh, if we put God with his name Joseph, it means God is the one who adds or increases That's the the meaning of his name. God increases. So wherever he goes, God blesses. Why? Because his name means that. It's good to know some of these things because it helps us to understand even when Joseph was named, God had a purpose. Even when you were born, God had a purpose and a destiny. Amen? Amen? Are you living in that purpose and destiny this morning? And I pray it by the end of this sermon, we will all be able to say amen to that. Genesis chapter 39. If you have found it in your Bibles, please say Christ likeness. Amen. Please rise with me as I read God's word. Genesis chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in the eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put in charge of his put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. Is your home blessed because of you? Is your workplace blessed because of you? May it be so, just like Joseph. Let's carry on. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left Joseph in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. It means that Potiphar, the only choice he made was choosing what food he was going to have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mac and cheese for breakfast, mac and cheese for lunch, mac and cheese for dinner. (laughs) That's what my son would choose. But that's how much Joseph was put in charge of the household. Carry on. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he, Joseph, refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day 
after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day, he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them. This Hebrew has been brought to, brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take a seat. Father God, we come before you with humble hearts, knowing that we need to receive from you this morning a revelation of who you are. God, with our finite minds, with our restricted minds, with our limited minds, we cannot know the infinite God, the limitless, boundless God. Yet, by your Holy Spirit, through your word, we want to hear from you this morning. So open our hearts to receive and open our spiritual eyes to see your glory. We need a word from you this morning, God. Many of us are carrying weight, burdens, anxieties, pain that we cannot carry by ourselves. And today, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will comfort us, but also convict us towards holiness, righteousness, purity, and power. We love you, Lord, and thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Question. Does the journey of life throw you curveballs? Yes. 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 Okay. How do you deal with curveballs when they come at you? The unexpected comes upon you. Suddenly, your car breaks down. Suddenly, your house is undergoing a leak, and you don't know where that's coming from. Suddenly, you get a pink slip. Suddenly, you hear that your health is not too good of a condition as you thought it was. How do you deal with it? Do you deal with it in a way that's calm, cool, and collected? Or do you fuss and do you feel like, oh, what am I going to do? The whole world is falling down. Do you feel like that? And at those times, do you feel like giving up? Oh, I give up. How many times have you done this? Oh, I give up. Oh, I give up. Yeah. Life circumstances throws curveballs at us and it almost seems like to expect the unexpected is kind of like the way of life for many of us. We, we want to give up many a times when we see no hope. You do the same thing and it, it doesn't improve. You try to work it out with a spouse, but they won't listen to you or they won't change. You ask your spouse to please put their socks in the basket. That's all I want you to do, honey. <laughs> Just in the basket. But what do I do? Well, I leave it on the table. I leave it on the floor. I'm, I'm telling my... St I, I'm ashamed. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm embarrassed. And I'm trying to do my best. But by God's grace, my wife is not giving up on me. 
when people break promises to you and when you break promises to yourself. How many of you had New Year's resolutions this year? Yep, 2018, I'm going to do this and I'm going to work out and I'm going to eat less of this not good stuff and I'm going to eat more of this good stuff. How many of you are still on track? Come on, come on, come on. Maybe you wanted to thank you. Praise the Lord. Good for you. Good for you. That's why I don't make New Year's resolutions. <laughs> That's how I handle it. People break promises to us. We break promises to ourselves, and we just want to give up. We sometimes see no progress at work. You keep working and working, and they don't give you a promotion. I heard uh, last week uh, from a friend that he asked his boss for a dollar raise, and they would not give it to him. Just one dollar an hour. That's he said. But no, no, no progression. Oh, what about when children will repeatedly not listen to you? <laughs> repeatedly. Son. Please, don't do that. He'll do it again. Push the button. Push the button. And then he loves my reaction. Please, son, don't. He does it again. <laughs> does it again. And we want to give up, but we can't because he's my son. What about when you watch the news? You, you see the political climate. You see what's going on around the world, all the killing, and oh, my goodness, breaks my heart. Yeah, that sometimes makes us want to give up. Oh, what about when your investment, bitcoins, right? You know, they, it was going up and then it goes down. What about the stock market? It was going up and then it went down. Did I tell you my story about my investment accolades? Well, don't do it, especially how I did it. I, I listened to people and I thought that was good news. In fact, it was rubbish. You know? <laughs> I invested in rubbish. Nonetheless, some of those things really... Um, just keep us from wanting to go on. My message for you from God, from his word today is this. It's very easy. Don't give up. Don't give up. We find a, a person in the Bible today. His name is Joseph. And you know the story, but let me just give you a brief recap. Joseph uh, was born into a family. He had a lot of siblings. He had brothers. And he was, I think, the 11th in line. And his father loved him. Israel loved Joseph. And when you love somebody, you like to give them gifts. Just like my mother and father-in-law. Do you like the suit I'm wearing this morning? This was a gift. Yeah, my, my parents. What, does it look nice? Yeah. Do, do you like the tie? It's Korean, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a gift. It's my Technicolor dream coat, by the way. <laughs> Joseph also had that kind of you know, love and care, and his dad gave him this beautiful coat. And then we call him, let's call Joseph the dreamer boy, okay? Dreamer boy. Is that all right, Mitch? Dreamer boy. Okay, he had dreams that God gave him, and he's 17, right? So he tells his parents, he tells his brothers, and do they like his dream? No, no, no. The, the dream's like, oh, you're going to worship me and do this. What on earth are you talking about? You're my little brother. I'm not going to listen to that. So what do they do? Well, they, they really hate him, so they plan to kill him. But by God's grace, he does not get killed. He actually gets sent off into a different um, land. Uh, he's sold to the Ishmaelites, and they're the traveling people, the nomads of the day, and they sell Joseph into Egypt. So Joseph is an immigrant, uh, involuntary, by the way. He's a slave. He's sold. And then Potiphar is the guard. He's the captain of the guard for, for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So pretty high official. And he's brought into this household. And today we see what happens inside the household of Potiphar. What's going through Joseph's mind when he's betrayed by his brothers? They want to kill him. What's going through his mind when he's sold? What's going through his mind when he's sold as a slave into a culture that he has no idea about, a language that is so foreign to him? Even the food that they eat is not this kind of food that they are used, he's used to. What's going through Joseph's mind? Does he have the ingredients for giving up? What do you think? Does he have the right ingredients? Yes, he does. 
He does. He has the right ingredients to give up. But one thing that keeps him going, I believe, through the text, is that Joseph knew God had a purpose for his life. Joseph knew God had a divine dream for his life. And that dream, that vision, kept him on track to not give up. What are, the, what are the dreams that God has given you? Maybe when you were younger, when you were in Sunday school, you, you prayed and you knew that God was going to use you as a missionary. You know, did you have those kind of moments? For me, I can't forget when I was 15 years old. I was at a summer camp revival meeting, and I was sitting right at the back, and there was a missionary from Russia, and he spoke, and I don't remember what he said, and that's why I don't blame you for not remembering what I say. <laughs> but at the end, he gave an altar call. He said, come to the front if you want to be prayed for, because I believe God is calling missionaries. And I'm like, missionary? Oh, I, I don't want to <laughs> do that. Uh, but as he was inviting me, he said, this is the final call, and that's when I found myself coming to the cross. And he prayed for me. And it was that day I knew that God was calling me to missions. So that dream, that vision, that purpose of God has been the driving force of my own life. With all the ups and downs that God has led me through, I'm still on course by the grace of God. I am not giving up. Four months ago, as you know, I was given a, a role, a position, that I had never even imagined of. Uh, I, I was serving alongside uh, my best friend, and uh, I wanted to help, be a helper, be a right-hand guy, you know, do all the odd work and just get it done. That's what I wanted to do. And then my hope, my dream, was to go and to make disciples and to plant churches and to evangelize and do things like that. But God had a different plan. And I could have given up. I could have said no. But I know well enough, as probably you do, that when God speaks, it's pretty good to listen. And God was tugging at my heart. And one of the things that I did in my first week of receiving this wonderful position <laughs> was to come here and say, Lord, I'm going to bury my dreams. I'm going to bury all the aspirations at the foot of the cross right here. So if, if you want to come and see it, you can come see it. It's right there because I laid it down before him. And as I did that, God was giving me this hope that, wow, Elisha, you're in a new season of your life now. And God has given me a hope that is welling up within me. It's like streams of living water. It's like God empowering me to do the impossible. And I'm so grateful to be able to be on this journey with you. Now, talking about journeys, let's look at Joseph in this portion of his journey. We have to talk about Potiphar's wife today. And it might be uncomfortable for you, but let's talk about what happens. Well, we know that through the text that everything Joseph did, God gave favor and it prospered. So maybe Potiphar's household was not doing too well before Joseph came into the picture. But now, since Joseph is working there, and is he slacking in his work? What do you think? Do you think he's working hard? Yes, I believe so. He's working hard, he's doing the chores, and he's giving ideas to his master, saying, Master, if we streamline it this way, it's going to work better. Master, I see that we're wasting money in that field, so let's do this. And I just see him working hard for the master, and, and God gives favor. And it really doesn't help <laughs> that in verse 6, that he was well-built and handsome. Now, when you're well-built and handsome, so how many of our men in the room feel like that? Well-built and handsome? Amen. All right, praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. Uh, it's a hopeful wish, okay? 
No, I, I think I'm handsome because of this Technicolor dream coat. <laughs> Potiphar's wife takes notice. And this is where I want to kind of share with you some of the observations I see about how the evil one tries to lure us away from the road of righteousness. The thing is, the temptation of all humankind began in Genesis chapter 3 when the serpent lured Eve, right? Said, you know, just take, take a bite of this fruit. It's okay. And I found that in Genesis now, chapter 3, verse 6, it began with the woman seeing. When the woman saw, it was pleasing to the eye. Now, um, Valentine's Day is coming up, and the gentlemen are gearing up to give good gifts to uh, their spouses and, and girlfriends and, and fiancés and things like that. Uh, isn't it intriguing when you walk into a shop with your wife, and I say, Sarah, choose anything you want. This is your day. And my wife, she, she doesn't really want many things. She's very content. But she's, she says, oh, honey, I, I have everything I need. You know, I, I don't really need this, but this kind of looks nice. <laughs> and she picks something. And for me, you know, I'm not a stingy person, but I have to look at the price tag, right? <laughs> I have to live within my means. And every time she chooses something, it's the most expensive thing in the whole store. <laughs> it's somehow God has gifted her with the eyes to pick the, the nicest, most pleasing to the eye. Now, ladies, please be careful. That's how the enemy wants to lure you in, with flashy, glittery things, even on the screen, even in your, in your magazines, or that you want to pick out and that 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 nagging feeling of, oh, if I have that, I'm going to be more beautiful. I'm going to be more satisfied. I just need that. No, I want it. So I'm going to get it. Even if I have to just max out my credit card, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Debbie, you're laughing. Are you hitting a chord somewhere? See, that's how the, the enemy wants to kind of lure you in and take your gaze off what's real. And what's real? Eternity. Let me tell you, reality is eternity. What you sow into eternity will matter. What you sow into this earth, it may have some, some value, but it won't hold its value for eternity. Okay, so first, Potiphar's wife took notice. So be careful of your eyes. I remember a children's song that I learned. You know, be careful. Little eyes, what you see. And how does the rest of the song go? For the father. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, if you are looking at things that bring you away from the love and the mercy and the grace of God, I ask you to stop today. I don't care if it's pornography. I don't care if it's something that just grabs a hold of your heart, if it's sports. If it's tearing you away from putting your eyes upon God and his righteousness, I ask you to stop. And I'm not being a legalist, but I'm being a realist. Because what you let into your eyes what you let into your ears, what you let into your heart is actually going to affect you in a lot of ways. Because what you put into your eyes and your ears and your heart, it's going to take motion inside of you. And by the end of the day, you'll be thinking more about it, meditating on it. And by the end of the day, you'll be speaking about it. And by the end of the day, you'll be acting out on it. See what's happening to Potiphar's wife? She saw and noticed that Joseph is a handsome and a well-built person, so she's lusting after Joseph. And what happens? She says, come to bed with me. Where is, where is the courtesy and manners? Where is the, the goodness that she has the audacity to say, come to bed with me? 
when she has a husband? Why look to somebody else? Today must be the day when we stop and recognize, just as John Wesley's mom would say, if anything takes your mind off of God, get rid of it. I'm paraphrasing. Get rid of it. It's not good for you. Why would you keep on having poison around you when it's not good for you? We need to stop and think about the things that we do. Martin Luther would say this, you can let a bird pass over your head, but please don't let it nest so that it continues to build something in you. Don't give the enemy a foothold. Pontifa's wife continues in verse 10. She is persistent. Day after day, she would say, come, let's sin together. Do you know what the devil does? The devil doesn't show you the consequences. He only shows you the upfront part of the glittery, shiny thing that's going to give you a short amount of pleasure at the beginning. He never shows you the consequence of sin. That's his scheme. So let's not be deceived. John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is someone who wants to take you down. But our holy God is a God who redeems and brings you out. And then in verse 12, I see that Potiphar's wife not only is nagging day after day, now she becomes forceful. She grabs him, (coughs) right? Come on, let's do it. Let's sin right now. And when she cannot get her way, she begins to lie about Joseph from verse 13 to 18. Now she's in it for the blood. You don't want to follow me? I will get you. I will find you. Listen, this is no joke. We are not playing church. I am not here to play church. This is a real battle. This is a spiritual battle that the enemy is onslaughting you with things that are so impure. And he wants you to be lured away from the holy things, from the word of God, from the place of prayer. How many of you want to join us for the march of prayer? How many of you want to commit one day, two days, three days, or even every day to praying? Amen. Yes. Yes. Let's come together and seek God's face because we cannot fight off the enemy with our own strength. Do you think he's a wimp or he's not clever? He's very clever, you know. The devil will come at you and he knows your weakness just like that. And he will keep on prodding day after day, moment after moment. He will say, come on, come on, just one time. It's okay. No one's going to know. Just do it. What do we say? We say no, we refuse. We learn from Joseph. How does he do it? Well, in verse 8, he says he refused. He didn't give up. He didn't give up to the temptation. He said no. Everyone say no. No. When the enemy comes at you, you say no. In the name of Jesus, be gone. You don't belong here. I am the temple of the living God. How dare you try to infiltrate dirtiness, impurity, into a place where the Holy Spirit dwells. His name is holy. That means there is no sin. No wonder the church is so weak, not ours, but just in general. Because we live as the world lives. And we bring in the same thing on Sunday morning, and we act as if nothing's wrong. Wake up, church. And I'm preaching it myself today. I'm preaching it myself because I don't want to see me standing before God at the judgment day, at the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to say, well, you, Elijah, I, I, I gave you so much time. I gave you so many resources. I gave you talents that you could use for the kingdom, and you decided not to. I shudder to think. The responsibility of being a pastor is very heavy. Do you know that? 
It's a spiritual weight that I carry every day. Yes, I do have a day off. I try to get a day off, okay? On Monday mornings, I try to have my day off. But every day, I carry the weight of your pain, your worry, your anxieties, and your joys, and I bring them before the Lord. I say, Lord, this family is suffering right now. They're going through a tough time, and they need you. And I really want to see healing in this family, Lord. And I I cry out. I intercede. And then when I hear news about some joyous things, Lord, there's there's a new life. Thank you for a new life in a certain family. Bless the baby. Bless the family. It's a weight I carry. But I can't do this. And sometimes, yes, the devil comes in and says, you can just give up, you know. And what do I say? No, in the name of Jesus, be gone because this is my calling. This is my destiny that God has for me. Basically, what I'm saying is I love you all. And I need your prayers so that I can continue to fight the good fight and to persevere in faith. And if that's your prayer for me, then my prayer for you is this, that you will go all in to a lifestyle that is sold out for God and that you will persevere in your faith to run the race marked out for you. Don't compare with other people. God has a unique path. And isn't that great? Because I don't like copies. I like something that's unique. That's why I like this suit. You know why? Because it was made for me. No one else has it. I like it. And likewise, God has a unique destiny for each one of you. Don't compare yourselves with, oh, that person's doing this, they're traveling around the world, they're living their dreams, they're doing this and that. Plant yourselves all into the purposes of God. And don't give up. Joseph continues to say to Potiphar's wife that I know my boundaries. My master has given me this amount and I am not going to go beyond my means. And this is important. Listen, listen. God has given you boundaries in life. If he's given you a family, a wife, That is your portion. That is your lot. Don't look elsewhere. I said stop looking at other things that pull you away from God. Don't do it. And don't give in. Thank you, Leo. Don't do it. Because there is value in holiness. There is value in righteousness and purity. God's covenant relationship is found within the realms of marriage. And it's a beautiful thing that we have to protect. Amen, Eddie and Georgia? Amen. We have to protect newlyweds. And then he says this. He acknowledges God in verse 9. And I love this. How can I? How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph lived a life that was in front of God. In other words, it's karam deo. It's living in front of God. Living as if God is here right now, and I'm going to make my choices according to his will and purposes. Sometimes I know that I'm making a bad choice if I'm going for a very sweet drink, right? Uh, I, I did have a Coke yesterday, and I really didn't want to, but it's just like so sweet. And I'm not not against Coke, you know, I like Coke, especially cherry Coke, you know, (laughs) so nice, but so much sugar, and I know it's not good for me, but if I align myself fully to his will and to his purposes and to the destiny that I have, I know that if I have this right now, it's, it's really good on my tongue. But it doesn't, help build me into the man of God that wants to stand before you and to say, I believe that the Lord is giving me
I believe the Lord is giving me a, a sense of saying no to some of these pleasures because I want to fulfill his purposes. And again, I'm not being legalistic. I'm sharing this with you to be vulnerable with you, even in the small choices. Because in the choices, I want to build the character that God has for me so that when I come to the big choices, I will make the holy choice. <coughs> he not acknowledges God, but he also runs away. He removes himself from the situation. And that's wise. Don't give the devil an inch. If you feel that this place that you're in is luring you in, in deeper, 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 then you just have to step aside and, and get out of the situation. Don't play with fire. I like Joseph because I see his life being an all-in life. And he lives a life that really perseveres. He's not giving in. He's not giving up. There was a teacher and a student. And the teacher noticed that the student was always playing the victim card. Oh, woe is me. You know, something happens. Oh, it's raining today. Oh, it's raining. It's snow. Oh, it's snowing. My, my check didn't come. Oh, my check didn't come in. Like everything's so like, ah! So the teacher wanted to teach the student a lesson. He said, uh, bring me a, just a handful of salt. So he brought the salt in, and he said, well, put it into this cup with the water in it. So he put it in, and the teacher said, uh, you drink it now. So he did. Guess how he reacted? Oh, it's so salty! The teacher said, bring me another handful of salt. And they go to a lake, and he says, put it in the lake. So he does. And then he gets the cup, and he says, okay, drink a cup of this. The teacher says, how does it taste now? Oh, it's refreshing. This is so nice. I like it. Hmm. When calamity comes your way, when a curveball comes your way, how you react is based on the capacity of how much you can hold the salt. Are you with me? See, if the salt goes into a small cup, the potency of the salt will always bring us down to a victim mentality. Woe is me. Why did that person have to do that to me? Don't they like me? What did I do to deserve this? All of these questions. Bring yourself down, down, down. But if God, and by his grace and by our choices, expands our capacity for us to become a lake, I want to become a lake. Amen? Do you want to become a lake? So when calamity, anxiety, curveballs come my way, I can still drink from the lake, and I can also invite others to come and drink from the lake, which will refresh you and refine you. I believe through Joseph's small choices of life, in working hard, in accepting what God had for him, his destiny, his purpose, his dreams, that his heart was being expanded to a capacity that even if all the salt in the world was thrown at him, he'd be able to still rejoice and be at peace, knowing that God is with me. Never once... Did we ever walk alone? Never once did he leave us on our own. He is faithful. We serve a faithful God, so we follow him. And my challenge to you is that you will go all in to his faithfulness and persevere through the tough times. And don't get bitter about it. By God's grace, we get better. We become more defined. And listen, a warrior scars and struggles on the way, the, the song says, right? A warrior does not, is, is not like a, a porcelain skin type of person, right? A warrior has, has scars to prove it because he's been working, he's been training, and he's been in the battle. He has weathered. 
We need to be built up as soldiers and warriors for Christ. His kingdom is expanding and he is calling us today to go all in. And don't give up. Please, don't give up. Because God is not giving up on you. Listen, Jesus, he didn't need to go to the cross. He had no reason. He had no sin. And yet he chose to persevere. He had 39 lashes. 39. If he had one more, he would have died. And yet he perseveres to the cross. He carries the cross. He carries the weight of our sins on his shoulders. And he dies a gruesome death. And he does not give up. Why? Because God is not giving up on you. And for the joy set before him, Hebrews writer says, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat at the right hand of the Father. Jesus Christ, he did not give up. And if we are becoming more Christ-like this year, we are not going to give up as a church. Amen? Amen. Through whatever tough situation we will not give up because god is faithful because he does not give up on you listen i'm teaching my son how to listen and obey and many a times he will not right have you experienced that before it just doesn't happen doesn't happen but do i give up on teaching him the right ways to go no why because I love him. And it's the same with our Father God in heaven. He loves you with an everlasting love that he would give his one and only son for you. If you were the only person on this planet, he would still give his son for you. And with that kind of love, why would we not want to gaze upon his beauty? Why would we not want to serve? Listen, I hate sin. Why? Because I love people. And I know what sin does to people. It harms them. And by God's grace, I have seen the consequences of sin. And I don't want you to make those choices and drink of those consequences of bitterness, shame, and guilt. Of course, there is forgiveness at the cross. Listen to me, please. God wants us to go all in. Let's live our lives for him. Full throttle. And you know what? As I've experienced God in these ways, he has freed me from myself. See, my own tendency is that I want to impress people. Do you like my Technicolor green coat? You know, I mean, I want to. But by God's grace, he has freed me. I don't care. And this is what I pray. God, give me thick skin and a tender heart. <laughs> Whatever you say to me, it's okay. I'm not offended. Because my worth and value and identity is firmly grounded upon his grace and upon his love. So you can't say anything that will offend me. Yes, I get hurt. And I'll say that to you, brother, sister. That, that stings a little bit. How's your day? What's going on? Let's go all in, brothers and sisters. We only live life once. Reality is eternity. And let's persevere the good, good fight. Let me finish by reading for you James. James talks a little bit about perseverance. And I want to just finish with James chapter 1, a couple of verses from James. James is uh, kind of at the back of the Bible, just before 1 Peter. James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Amen. And then verse 12. Blessed 
is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. We can only persevere when we know that he loves you. He loves you. And from that place of knowing and receiving his love, we'll be able to continue to grow in Christ-likeness. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we bow down before you knowing that you have a good and a perfect plan for each of our lives and for this church community. And we ask you to bless the preaching of your word. Though as weak as I am and frail as I am, I pray, Lord, that our people here and for those who are watching online, Lord, I pray that you would instill in us and engrave in us the words that you want them to remember. And Father, if I have misspoken in any way, forgive me, Lord. And I pray that we will continue to have a faith that perseveres, that does not give up, that does not give in, but always says no to sin and yes to righteousness and your holiness, O God. Grant us the fortitude to live a holy life for you because of your great love. Not because we have to do this to earn your love, but because we get to put a smile on your face by the choices we make. However small or medium or large, help us, Lord, to tread in your holiness behind you. And thank you that you've been with us and that you will continue to carry us. We honor you, we love you, we thank you for your fire. May it continue to burn in our hearts and to rise up as the bride, the bride, in a hopeless world that needs you, God. We pray that we would be a force to be reckoned with in the North Shore area to unleash your gospel to those who need you to unleash your gospel in this nation, to unleash your gospel in the nations. Father God, may that day come, and we look to you with expectancy. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.